Thank you for listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg, Queen of Perpetual Help, and welcome to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. On this week's broadcast, we return to WSFI, our sister station's Reclamation Theology with Kyle Clement, and a special thanks to Angela Tomlinson, who is behind each episode. Kyle talks more about developing your Catholic conscience and how that relates to the vaccine. This is the conclusion of this series. And if you'd like a copy of this broadcast, visit wsficatholicradio.org. And he must have a firm grasp of the unchanging message so that he can be counted on both for giving encouragement in sound doctrine and for refuting those who argue against it. WSFI 88.5 FM presents Reclamation Theology with Kyle Clement. Hello and welcome to this first Friday episode of Reclamation Theology with Kyle Clement. I'm your host, Angela Tomlinson, and Marianne Harold from our sister station, WQPH, is also with me. Kyle Clement is loyal to the Magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church. He's been involved in the curriculum, consultation, formation of priests and laity relating to Catholic liberation and exorcism for over 15 years. A member of the Religious Association Societas Matras Dolorissime, he and Father Chad Ripperger, his superior, provide instruction, evaluation, case investigation, and consultation to dioceses throughout the world. And Marianne, you're there. Yes, I am. Amen. Okay. So, Kyle, what will we be talking about this morning? I think that it's opportune. We do well always and everywhere to talk about the formation, maintenance, and utilization of a Catholic conscience. This has to be about the conversion of all souls, the rich as well as the poor. This has to be about the conversion of all souls. And this brings me to another point, because requisite with this is the use of some buzzwords self-identification and it's gone to absurdity the catholic conscience helps you know exactly who you are prudence helps you know exactly who you are where you are in the cosmos where you are in the cosmic scheme of things this idea of self-identification outside of reality is absolutely absurd so if i tell you that today i'm identifying as a seven foot tall black woman if you can see me most of you who can hear me would chuckle because that's absurd well, what happens when a politician identifies, self-identifies as a Catholic, yet has an unblemished promotion record of abortion? It doesn't matter what he says he is. It doesn't matter what he claims to be. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. It can't be a duck identifying as a bear in order to endear himself to other bears. One of the things about the Catholic conscience is we are the small boy who says the emperor has no clothes. We are Captain Obvious. You may want to say you're a Catholic. You may go to Mass. You may present yourself for the Eucharist. You do not behave as one. And so that is the key, is to understanding, are you who you say you are? St. Paul, does your yes mean yes? Does your no mean no? Are you who you say you are? Then either become who you say you are or stop doing the things which are inconsistent with who you say you are. Now, I'm speaking to prelates. I'm speaking to priests. I'm speaking to laymen. I'm speaking to anybody and everybody. If you are a husband and a father then be a husband and a father. You cannot look at certain things. You cannot think certain things. You can't do certain things or go certain places because it's inconsistent with your vocation. When people in positions of leadership, fathers of families, domestic churches, as well as cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests, when they speak in contrary to their vocation, contrary to the faith, then this raises up a distress and an anxiety in the souls of those whom they are supposed to lead. And very, very quickly, we as sheep find ourselves in a howling wasteland of modernism and relativism, which is devoid of any of the landmarks of true faith, tradition, virtue, even scripture. Shepherds, you have led us into a a wasteland, a range that we do not know. 
And we as the old rams are going to stop at the margin of this howling wasteland and say, we will follow you no further. Common sense at some point says, suddenly, because of modern circumstances, something is not now permissible that was impermissible or was immoral for centuries. No sale. This is the Catholic conscience in action. It's properly formed through the virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And then that cardinal virtue of prudence says, I cannot go here, knowing what to do and when to do it. When the sheep balks, when they stop, when their failure to follow has to, to go deep into the shepherd's heart and says, why will they no longer follow? Because you're leading them someplace that is bad for them and they know it. And their love of you and their obedience for you will not override their Catholic conscience, will not override what they know to be true. Somewhere about 30 years ago, priests began telling us what was sin and what was not sin in the confessional. Prior to that, they understood that we had a functional Catholic conscience, and I'm confessing it because it's causing me distress. It's not to be dismissed. So now, modernly, what we have is counselors instead of confessors. Find a confessor. Find someone that will hold you into account, and he will help you hone an edge onto your Catholic conscience, which lets you hack through this temporal brush. So the next one is temperance. Temperance is most interesting in St. Thomas's definition because we modernly define temperance as uh, a moderation of activity. St. Thomas goes much, much deeper. I'll take a little bit of a sidebar here and tell you that it's, it's most disappointing and egregious when we have prelates who have written a series. We have a bishop who has written a series, and the, the virtues are simply methods to counter vice. When we do this, we turn St. Thomas's teaching upside down. Vices militate against virtue. Virtue has the purity, the primacy. And so the virtues are not some tool or disposition or discipline to, to combat vice. There's something to be cultivated, to be maintained, to be established, and vice comes against them. It may seem like a trifle, but it's a very important thing because what has happened is we've redefined the virtues from the way St. Thomas did it to the seven deadly sins, their vices, and which virtues oppose them. This gives the primacy to the diabolical, the primacy to the sin, that this is a disorder. So in temperance, St. Thomas goes beyond behavior, and he says it is a moderation of the attraction. Listen to that. A moderation of attraction and desire, first and foremost, because St. Thomas says, essentially, if you can't purify the, the appetites, the desires, the attractions, then it's going to be almost impossible to purify the action. Very, very key. We as Catholics used to understand this, that we had to purify our thoughts before we could purify our words and our deeds. Oftentimes and modernly, we're taught to confess only the deed. It is preceded by the thought. St. Thomas knew this. The other uh, patriarchs knew this. The fathers of the church knew this. And they talked about the purity of thought. Another area here is with regard to purity of thought is we've got a deviant element in theology, and especially in the last 50 years, 60 years, where we've got lay theologians who are not living a life of virginal purity, who are not reading the scriptures with that purity, who are not studying our, our Lord uh, and faith and, and doctrine with that purity of religious vocation. And so they're bringing these outside elements in. And you've got women teaching in seminaries. You've got lay people teaching in seminaries that are not religious, that are not properly formed, and some of them are not Catholic. Even within the orders that are charged with maintaining the faith, uh, chief among them is the Society of Jesus that has fallen so low from where their founder, St. Ignatius, was charged with preserving the faith in light of the Re Reformation. We've got now this ecumenical outreach to where we see this Jesuitical thought corroding and deforming the very foundation of our Catholic education and understanding. And so it is this rampant, rabid ecumenicism that is really the focus of attack from within the church. And, and it's where the outside meets the inside. It's the fifth column. Uh, if, for those of you who don't know, that reference is 
the fifth column was a column of dissenters inside a uh, government which allows a coup to happen. So you've got an attack from all four directions. Those are the four main columns. And then you've got the fifth column, which will be those sympathizers inside. We are seeing this in the coup that, that is happening, the cultural coup that is happening in our country. And that's no less than what we're seeing is a cultural coup where those which are against the, the purity of faith, those that are against Christianity, those that are against virtue, are wresting control, um, are taking control uh, of our governance. And so to understand that temperance moderates the desire, the attraction and the desire. And in that moderation of attraction and desire, then we can moderate action, thought and action. There are many other daughters, so I'm skipping over that. Fortitude is the willingness to engage the arduous, again, to achieve the good. So this is something that we as a snowflake society, we become a, a society of snowflakes. We see this all the time. I get multiple inquiries uh, through the Society of the Most Sorrowful Mother to investigate extraordinary diabolical phenomenon. And what I would propose to you is this, is that modernly any type of adversity is designated as extraordinary because we're not used to adversity. We want the easy path. We want the effeminate path. We want the pleasurable path. And so any kind of adversity, we either take it as we shouldn't do the thing or uh, it's extraordinary adversity. In the back of the Roman Missal is almost a throwaway line at the beginning of the section on prayer, and it says prayer is a battle. Wow, prayer is a battle. Exactly. We've known this for centuries. We've known this from since day one. Relationship with God is a battle as a result of our fallen nature. And so a battle does not, it, it's spiritual warfare. It's not spiritual negotiation. This military imagery is something that's been with the church since the beginning. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time on the last cardinal virtue, which is justice. Major misunderstanding of this one. Major misunderstanding of justice. If you understand justice correctly, then your Catholic conscience is complete as far as your toolkit, your virtue toolkit, and then the ability to, to listen with a just ear. So here's justice. Justice in St. Thomas's de definition is very, it's a very curt definition. Render another his due. To render another his due. It's not to give each creature his due. That's modern phraseology. It's to render another his due. So let's parse out those five words. Render. He didn't say give. Render. In rendering, it goes beyond giving. It is a bringing forth. It is a, an acknowledgement that this, in fact, belonged to the other first. It's almost the, the understanding of bailment. When I give you something for safekeeping and then I come to you and I say, now, Render unto me what is mine. This is in the story of Tobit. This is in various uh, things. When, when the master comes back to the talents, uh, to the, the uh, servants he had entrusted the talents. So to render is the understanding that the source was not mine. This is not mine. It's beyond me. I'm acting at most as a steward. So what does that call? It immediately calls us to the understanding that all justice must come from and serve God. So give another. Who is the other? Who is the primary other in all of our lives, in all of the world, in all of creation? The primary other is God the creator. So all justice must be vertically oriented. It must first come vertically. It must be established vertically before it can be spread horizontally. Please see the sign of the cross. It must first be orientated to the creator and flow vertically into your heart, into your conscience, into your intellect, into your will, and then down into the other faculties before it becomes functional justice, divine justice on a horizontal plane or within the community or within society. So to give another his due, we must first and foremost give to God what is due him, worship. We circle back to the holy writ of the prayer with which we started. All heartfelt right worship is reserved to God alone. No creature, no, not the earth, not humanity, not anything else ranks where this is. 
theologians talk about the three levels of veneration as dulia, hyperdulia, and latria. Dulia is that which is due a superior, who is our obvious superior, saints. Uh, we owe them. We are obliged to give them veneration and acknowledgement as superior to us through the form of dulia. Hyperdulia is reserved to the Blessed Mother alone. She is queen of saints. She is queen of angels. She is mother of God and as such occupies a place in the cosmos that no other creature occupies, thereby obliging us to offer to her hyperdulia. Then latria, worship that is due God alone. The three persons of the Holy Trinity are due all right worship, all latria. And so latria, worship of God, elevation of God above all things, now opens us to divine justice, the understanding that all justice flows through God the Father, Christ the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. There was sacred art that we used to see quite often that showed uh, God the Father supporting the cross on which Christ the Son was suspended and dying, and then the Holy Ghost is bearing witness, ready to take it on the wings of a dove into all the world. On the ground, right facing up, their child between them is the Blessed Mother and God the Father. This is the understanding of mediatrics of all graces. This is the understanding of co-redemptrix. She, no less than he, is giving her son. This is the dulia, hyperdulia, latria. This is that progression. This is that understanding that forms our conscience. So anything that is militates against the Blessed Mother, the sanctity of life, any of these things militates directly against this understanding of justice, of justice. This is why interiorly we don't have to be able to, to give the bioethical argument of why these tainted vaccines abrade divine justice. We don't have to give that argument. We simply have to say, look at the cross, look at the sacrifice, look at the gut justice that is due God. What is due every, as God now goes down into the cosmos and creation and is due every single creature, the opportunity for life that was given by God. There is no set of circumstances that changes this, that mitigates that justice, especially our fear of death now makes it okay for something else, another human to die. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Catholics of all ages, stand up, stand up. It does not matter who gets the vaccines venerable Fulton Sheen. It does not matter who's right. I mean, <laughs> right is right, even if no one is. Even if no one is. We have not, while we see prelates receive vaccines, we don't see prelates in ashes and sackcloth. While we see prelates get vaccine, we do not see prelates relegating themselves to a life of penance and prayer. While we see prelates argue for state we don't see them argue for church. The primary obligation of each and every one of us as Catholics is to defend the faith, not apologize for it, defend it. Do not allow the culture to overwhelm us without opposition, without us at least opposing. We are the conscience of the culture, be it. It's not a popular place. It is not a popular place. It will become less popular. But right is right, even when no one is. Let us discuss the actions of God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and not focus on the actions of men. Let us not be critical and judgmental of, of malformed, deformed, and prelates who may have a good desire in their heart but are misdirected. We don't need to parse that out. Simply, the emperor has clothes or he has no clothes. The actions are consistent with Catholicism or they're not. You have a properly formed Catholic conscience. Continue to form it. Continue to maintain it. Continue to wield it as a weapon. Wield it with charity. Wield it with the understanding that we as sheep will not be led into this howling wasteland of relativism and modernism that is devoid of the hallmarks of virtue, doctrine, and dogma, the landmarks that are necessary to navigate this spiritual wasteland. We will not be led into it. So that is the formation, maintenance, and utilization of a properly formed Catholic conscience. It's not to trouble you. It's simply to say, 
be about this job of forming the conscience, sharing the conscience, sharing the faith. And one of the ways that we maintain the universal calibration of our instrument is daily prayers. I highly recommend the Angelus three times a day, six noon six. Let's reclaim our proclamation of the incarnation of the Karl Bachtemes and our Blessed Mother's role in salvation. Let's reclaim this very basic tenet of Catholic faith. The more we can intone the Angelus and get it in the air, the greater uh, a voice we have. Be willing to speak very calmly that these actions are consistent or inconsistent with our Catholic faith. Be willing to use this instrument on yourself and your family. My thoughts are not consistent with the Catholic faith. They're not consistent with salvation. They're not consistent. And confess those thoughts. Find a priest who will listen to your confession and hold you accountable. We are not to cower. We are the church militant, not the church reticent, not the church cowering, not the church hanging out, not the church chilling, not the church going along, not to make waves. We are the church. So if you have questions, I would be happy to entertain those questions at this point. Angela, Marianne. Marianne. Okay. Um, well, we obviously you have addressed most of the issues that I wanted to question you about, Kyle, very, very well and with charity. Uh, we have a duty as a, a Catholic commitment to Catholic Radio to support the truth that you're talking about. And also to people come to adoration who are misguided or their consciences have followed the masses and the sheep. What is the best preparation for the leaders like Angela, like you? What do you do to prepare yourself to go into battle? It's a great question. There are three things that I do. And the primary one I want to cycle back to because I, I think this is something that's very, very important. Many of the saints said that to contemplate the four last things, we must do that daily. If one does that daily, then it keeps you anchored in where you are in the cosmos. And so it's the contemplation of the four last things. It's the acknowledgement of the four last things. And if you don't know them, I'm going to ask you to look them up. Um, I'm not going to give them to you because the daily contemplation of the four last things now brings me to the second one. The second one is I spend some time in front of a picture of the sacred heart, gazing into his eyes and gazing into his sacred heart, knowing that it is that face, those eyes that I will meet at particular judgment. I will have to answer and say, I allowed someone with blasphemous or heretical thoughts to broadcast or to talk without opposition, or I allowed someone to lead people astray. I allowed my priest to say certain things without me going to him in private and saying, Father, what you're saying is inconsistent with the Catholic faith. And so I look into the eyes of the Sacred Heart for a period of the day and, and have an idea of what my day looks like. And then I formulate, will I act think and speak and act in such a way that I can stand in front of that image of particular judgment, our Lord, and look into the eyes of the sacred heart and justify my actions. And then the third thing I do is I look at my daily schedule and I say, I'm going to meet with these people or be present to these people or these animals or these creatures. And I pray for them individually. I pray for myself individually that we recognize the opportunities for virtue and to do the right thing and that we extend to one another the pure charity of God the Father through the Holy Spirit. And so those are the three things I do every day before we speak to anybody, before we do anything. I pray the Angelus and then, then take this moment because if we are instruments of God, then he's providentially placing us in times, places, locations where we will have the most salvific purpose. Beautiful. Angela, would you comment on that as well? No, Angela? I think that's, I, I, you know, one of the things I've learned to do is turn the television off, Marianne. I've really Excellent. blocked everything out now. All I do with my spare time, if I can, is I stay with my husband. But what he's doing, you know, he's six feet away from me. So Matt might be watching TV or a single program he puts on headphones. I, I'm spending all my time reading in Sinu Yezu. Kyle, are you familiar with that book? Yes. What do you think of it? Yes. I think it's it's a good foundational work. It's it's. Uh, 
I, th I think that it's good in as much as it, it grounds you. Uh, we don't need to get pulled away by the mystical. We don't need to be get pulled away by fads or by what's new and, and you know, the, the news of anytime you're reading about our Lord and our Lady, anytime you're reading about the saints, I think this is very, very functional formation and maintenance for the Catholic conscience. Is there a book that you'd recommend <laughs> at that beautiful time of the, you know, you've done your work, you, <laughs> you've finished, and now you want to kind of go to that beautiful, quiet place with the Lord. What do you read, Kyle? <laughs> Actually, I, it, it may seem uh, counterintuitive, but I'm a warrior at heart. I read Spiritual Combat, Dom Lorenzo Scopoli. Wow, um, classic. It never disappoints. It's always fresh. It's always something new. I look back on the day and realize I could have done this better. Um, and so it's a, it's a constant, if, if I'm a warrior, all day long out on the field swinging the saber the swinging the sword i need to sharpen it every night so to uh to bring the edge back excellent one of the things i want to ask you kyle we only have three minutes what is the website that people can go to to listen to the talks that you mentioned at the recent retreat i don't know the exact website it's saint joseph's church in Asheville. And so I think that if you go there, they've got a button you can click to to access the talks, uh, as well as Father Ripperger's talks. It's a parish mission that just completed. And then this coming Tuesday night, I do a Lenten reflection for them uh, as well. Then And they've made it available to the public. And so we'll, we'll do some Lenten exercises or, or talk about some possible Lenten exercises this next Tuesday. I don't have the exact website, but I think you can find it if you if you Google it with that or better still if you uh, duck, duck, go or, or yeah. use one of the other one of the other search engines. And so then I wanted to also promote this prayer through www.catholicprayercards.org uh, and it is most holy and ever virgin mary exterminatrix of heresies pray for us and protect the church from all error i think this is the prayer for our times it's a it's a very very poignant very important prayer i know that it's interesting if you've ever been around uh, a monastic group or a group that are praying if the leader makes a mistake then very simply the group just all goes silent and the leader immediately realizes okay i made a mistake i skipped a line or i did this and so their silence is their correction our prelates are not they're beyond that they're not looking back they're not listening we're going to have to speak we're going to have to say father cardinal archbishop we can't go there we're, we're hearing what you're teaching but it's just simply inconsistent with our catholic faith amen kyle we have a minute left would you lead us in a prayer in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit lord god almighty ancient of days jesus christ his only son our lord holy spirit vivifier renewer giver of life to you triune god we pray watch over us protect us give us strength to do your will in all things in christ's most holy name amen in the name amen. of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen god bless you kyle god bless you marianne till we meet again next first friday been listening to WSFI 88.5 FM, Reclamation Theology. A copy of this broadcast will be made available at WSFICatholicRadio.org. Thank you for listening to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast and hope you have a blessed week.